everyone. Welcome to what is the first Geotox Express session session for 2022. I'm delighted that you have joined us for this morning's session. Um, as you can see on the screen, we're going to be talking a little bit about the process of teaching um, the principles of GIS using Global Mapper. Uh, those of you who attended our full day Geotalk session last month, we spoke briefly on this topic and I did think it is worthwhile to expand a little bit on this idea of using Global Mapper as a tool in the classroom. Um, for this session, I'm joined by my colleague, Nate Tracy. Good morning, Nate, how are you? Good morning, everyone. Great, happy to be here. Delighted you're here, but Nate, if I'm not mistaken, I believe this is your first uh, Geotox Express session. Yes, my very wow. first. So Excellent. Well, delight, delighted to have you join the team. Please be, be nice to Nate. It is his first. Don't ask too many <laughs> difficult questions of Nate. Um, so we're going to cover a, a number of topics today, kind of broadly uh, on the theme of uh, using Global Mapper, as I mentioned in the classroom. Um, when you think about teaching GIS, we often think of teaching software. We, you, you need to, to you know, introduce the tools and how they work. And we're finding just based on our interaction with some of the folks in, in academia that they spend in a disproportionate amount of time uh, instructing on the tools and how the tools work. And we like to think Global Mapper actually addresses that problem very well because it is a, an intuitive application and it provides all of the tools you need in one package. So in in that sense, it's, it's really ideally suited for this purpose. And um, in interacting with folks in, from academia, from instructors, and even from students, um, we're hearing it does work well in that context. And, and today our objective is to introduce you to that process. We're gonna have a few hands-on workflows a little, bit later, Nate, a little bit later. Nate and I are gonna have a tag team a little bit and show you some of the instruction that can be carried out using Global Mapper. Um, but before we start that, we're gonna give you a little bit of a higher level overview of some of our academic programs. So that by way of what's coming, um, let's take a look at, uh, again, for those of you who haven't attended any of our sessions, some of the housekeeping issues. Um, obviously, I'm hoping that you can hear us. Now, that is the, the hope and expectation. Uh, looks like we are being broadcast. We're getting a confirmation of that. So those of you who are new to this uh, platform have never used this before. A few things to note here. I mean, obviously, you're in listen-only mode. Um, try as you might to ask us questions verbally. We are not able to hear you. Um, so you have an alternative. The questions panel that you're seeing over there on the right side of your screen, at pops out, I believe. You can type whatever questions you want. And we've already had a couple of questions asked uh, and comments as well. Comments are welcome as well. Both Nate and myself will be monitoring that throughout the course of our session. Um, answering those questions verbally typically. Um, if you have a question on a workflow or something that we've introduced, we will address that question so that everyone hears the response and maybe we can illustrate that uh, if necessary by demonstrating a tool in the software, for instance. Um, if we don't have a chance to answer those questions during the session, and sometimes we get a little overwhelmed with the number of questions that come in, we will follow up with you offline. Uh, we keep a record of these questions and we make sure that we will contact you directly after the session to give you the answer that you need. So keep those questions questions coming in, we will remind you of that as we go through our session today. We are recording this session. Uh, as registrants, you have access to the recording. Um, we will typically process that within a day or two. You'll get an email conf confirming that it is available. Not only this session, but all of our Geotox Express sessions are available to you as registrants. And I know some of you um, are watching the recording of this uh, because you were maybe unable to attend the live event, maybe a time zone issue, whatever. Again, you looking at the playlist within within the uh, uh, that YouTube link, you'll have access to all of the sessions, all of our Geotox ex uh, Express sessions. So again, you have that option. If you're watching the recording and you have questions, um, you can use an email to contact with us. Uh, I'll contact us with any of those questions. That will be in the description below. Um, I'll also put it on a slide when we wrap up our session today. Um, Nate, I think we've got some other sessions set up in the coming months. Do you want to tell us a little bit about some of the upcoming Geotox Express um, programs Absolutely. that are coming up? Yeah, happy to. Um, so in two weeks, we've got a great, uh, we're very excited for the upcoming release of Global Mapper version 23.1. Uh, that is well on its way. And so by the time of the uh, next Geotox Express session, uh, which is going to be on February the 23rd, we're going to do a, uh, that'll be out and we're going to do a, a little roundup of uh, some of the great new tools and, and features and improvements that are going to be available in 23.1. Uh, a month after that, we've got a, a little industry use case. So it's going to be about planning and engineering projects using uh, both Global Mapper uh, as well as bringing in some of the, the functionality uh, from Geographic Calculator too. So uh, using both of those applications. 
uh, April 20th, LiDAR Tips and Tricks. Um, I'm sure a lot of our users are familiar with uh, the LiDAR toolbox, but uh, it's always helpful to, you know, learn some of the maybe more lesser known tips and tricks and, and uh, you know, things that can make your, your workflow a little bit more, uh, a little bit easier, or a little more efficient, what have you. Uh, and then on May 25th, we've got uh, another industry use case, which is using a, a whole variety of tools in Global Mapper to do some coastal flooding analysis. Uh, so that's what's next for Geotox Express. Um, but then, of course, we also have uh, our, our regularly scheduled public trainings coming up. But of course, all that information is available uh, on our website, bluemarblegeo.com. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, I think there was a few more scheduled. That's all we had room for on the slide. If you go to our website, that's all. Let me go back to the slide here. Uh, bluemarblegeo.com geotox uh, xp um, you'll see all those there registration is open for all of these by the way just go ahead and uh, register when you can so they're on your calendar so um, you can plan your coming months accordingly um nate alluded to training uh, we actually have a training class that's going on right now unfortunately there's some folks who can't attend our webinar because they're being trained that class is on geographic calculator um, and we're seeing an increased interest in that application we also have upcoming a few other training a few alternative training opportunities here um, march and april we have two global mapper classes now this is a week-long session uh, three hours per day that goes through everything in the core of the software, ideally suited for new users, folks who are not familiar with Global Mapper. You have two opportunities in the coming months, as you see the dates here. LiDAR, um, um, kind of carried over from the LiDAR module training we used to have. We've continued with that training where we do a specific class on LiDAR processing and feature extraction on a lot of terrain analysis. Um, and that's a three-day class. Again, um, coinciding with the Global Mapper class, you can also take that LiDAR class the following week. If you do attend both sessions, by the way, it doesn't they don't have to be consecutive, but if you attend the, the Global Mapper class and the LiDAR class, uh, you will be recognized as a cert certified Global Mapper user. We send you a nice shiny certificate for the wallet of your office so you can uh, you can hang that up with pride and um, we also want to mention we have custom training as well we do get a lot of inquiries as to the availability of training that specifically meets maybe a company or organization absolutely we can do that let, uh, let us know if you're interested and we will set that up for you using your data and your time frame uh, right now we're obviously limited to online training but eventually hopefully we'll get back into the, op the um, option to come to your site to de deliver training um, at your facility so just some opportunities for training as I noted coming up um, Nate, do we want to ask these folks a question to make sure they're listening and paying attention? Yeah, of course. <laughs> always a good way to start, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. So we're always interested to know uh, from our attendees, uh, just, you know, what are they using Global Mapper for uh, in their day to day? Uh, but of course, the, the topic of this is teaching GIS in an academic or classroom setting. So uh, really what we're interested to know is uh, have you used Global Mapper in an academic setting? Um, whether you've been a teacher, a student, um, only in a, a non-academic professional setting, or, or if this is your very first exposure to Global Mapper, we, we're interested to know. So go ahead and uh, select those. Those options are just going to come up in that window in the quick poll. Um, so if you could just answer that, we'll take a, a minute or two to let those answers come in. Yeah, I'm seeing the results coming in. Quite surprising, there's a lot of folks who are joining our session today that are, are neither students or teachers, uh, I guess. Uh, there's still a lot to be learned uh, in Global Mapper, even outside of an academic situation. Quite a few students. Welcome to the students uh, who have yes. joined us. And I have to say, we usually insert this question as well, those of you who are not using Global Mapper. Um, as of right now, it looks like about 20% uh, of the folks who are joining us today have not used Global Mapper. Well, hopefully you as well uh, will get something from this session. So David, a couple more you seconds. Used Global Mapper in an academic setting. Yeah, so a couple more se session, uh, seconds here just to kind of allow you to fine tune your response and we'll go ahead and close that poll. Great, thank, thank you for your responses to that, by the way. Uh, very interesting and very useful for us to know uh, who we're talking with in these sessions. Okay, um, let's continue. Now, as I mentioned at the start, we're going to spend a little bit of time just, we don't like PowerPoint. Everybody hates a PowerPoint presentation. I've got a few obligatory PowerPoint slides that illustrate some of the components of Blue Marble's academic programs. Uh, just to give this a little context, um, several years ago, I'm thinking probably about eight or nine years ago now, we met with some uh, faculty from our local university system, the University of Maine, and asked them how we could best address the needs of the academic community. Well, based on those discussions, we developed a number of initiatives, a number of programs 
to facilitate the use of Global Mapper in an academic set, set, setting. Um, the most important was academic licensing. Um, uh, the result of the discussions, or as, an, as a consequence of those discussions, we introduced a program whereby if you're within the United States or Canada, and that's it's you know, fairly geographically limited uh, for the time being, we can give you a Global Mapper or Geographic Calculator at no cost if you're using it for teaching or if you're using it for lab work. If you're not using Global Mapper and you are in a US accredited university or college, absolutely contact us and we will be able to set you up with that complimentary license. And that will be, again, the, the latest version of Global Mapper will be available to you and to your students. If you're outside of the US, we also provide uh, a very deeply discounted academic licensing program as well. Um, again, you can get in touch with us. Uh, you'll see the uh, website at the bottom of the screen and we'll give you the details of what that entails. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll limit the, the financial barriers to deploying uh, Global mapper within your classroom situation. Again, as I mentioned, available for classroom teaching, hands-on lab instruction, and even for personal student use as well, uh, based on the teaching process that you go through. So um, that is one of the components of our our academic programs. Another one is our scholarship. Uh, those of you who attended our full day Geotux event uh, last month will have been introduced to our uh, scholarship winner from 2021, a really, really interesting study undertaken on the effects of um, submarine landslides on tsunamis, specifically studying the, uh, the Azor uh, archipelago in the Atlantic. If you haven't, you weren't at that event, you wanna see that, recordings of those sessions are also available. You can go to our website and, and uh, uh, we'll provide you access to the recordings of our GeoTalks. We haven't yet announced the scholarship for 2022, but it will be coming. It's open to any graduate or undergraduate student. Um, basically, you submit a thesis, project report, poster, whatever uh, platform within which you've used Global Mapper. Let us know how you've used Global Mapper. Very creative use cases where we will we will, uh, very often receive based on, on uh, projects or, or uh, academic study. Send us what you worked on. Um, we have a, a process of um, uh, analyzing the, the responses. We have a committee set up and we vote on the uh, winner. And it's probably the one of the most fun parts of my job to, to go through that process. Um, the winner will receive $1,000. Up from last year was $500. But this year we upped the ante to $1,000. You'll also get a copy of Global Mapper Pro, your own personal copy, over and above what you can access through your school. This is yours to keep. So um, if you are a student, and there are quite a few students attending today, by all means, you should uh, take a look at this program. And if you're a teacher, mention it to your students. Any work that they're doing ongoing, they can submit the results of that, and they will be in the running for our scholarship. Now, the final component of our academic programs we want to talk about, and this is what we're going to be spending most of our session on today, is the academic curriculum. It's a tool that we developed to facilitate the teaching of Global Mapper. We provide the necessary instructional materials. They are free. And again, this is not limited to a specific geographic area. If you request them and you're affiliated with an accredited university or college, you can access this, this, these resources at no cost. Um, there are 12 labs or 12 individual instructional sessions uh, sections covering a wide variety of, of GIS procedures. I'm going to show you what they are in just a second. Um, they include um, written instructions, they include the necessary data, they have screenshots to illustrate various procedures, and they also include uh, a, an exercise that the participants will follow uh, using the skills that they've learned in each lab. So um, as noted, step-by-step -step instructions as well as all of the required data files. Um, right now there are 12, that will likely expand, we're continuing to enhance this and add additional labs. Um, probably the most important one for students who are fairly new to GIS, your introductory students, the introduction to the principles of GIS. I'm actually going to be using a small component of this as our first illustration where we'll do a very simple exercise in spatial analysis um, using some of the content of this lab. Um, we've also got labs on terrain analysis, working with attributes and getting into the idea of thematic mapping, visual representation of your data. That's uh, one of the labs. Um, Nate, I believe you're going to be jumping in a little bit later and go walking us through the rectification process, okay. kind of moving into the raster world, um, the idea of, of aligning an image or rectifying an image. And I think Nate is going to show us, again, derived from the contents of this lab, an example of an historic map. We're going to align it. I think I'm spoiling the plot a little bit here, Nate, but uh, well, uh, you have to stick around for, uh, for that work. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, 
extracting vector features from a raster layer. Uh, this is a, a tool that we've enhanced significantly in version 23 of Global Mapper, but very useful for deriving vector features from identifiable pixels, if you like, within a raster layer. Um, I'll just go through the rest of these very quickly. Watershed, we have a, a lab on watershed. LiDAR, obviously very important uh, data format. A lot of folks are using this now. We have a, a, a lab that talks about LiDAR classification and extraction, like extracting vector features from LiDAR. Getting a little more into analytical side, we have a lab covering raster calculation. Moving into, uh, many of you I'm sure are familiar with our pixels to points tool, our photogrammetric tool in Global Mapper. Uh, we have a lab that illustrates that or, or goes through a workflow to derive a point cloud from, uh, uh, from images, from overlapping drone collected images. So we have a lab covering that content. Then a specific workflow related to a kind of an industry scenario or suitability analysis for solar projects. It brings in a lot of different uh, components of Global Mapper to illustrate maybe a, a more realistic workflow. Um, 3D change detection, one of my favorite tools, the idea of d differentiating based on a time series, um, a surface, maybe over a, a, a defined time frame. Um, those tools are available in Global Mapper and we have a lab for that as well. And finally here, and this is one that I will hopefully have a, a chance to demonstrate a little bit later as well, hydro flattening and terrain painting, some of the newer functionality uh, to do a little more advanced work with your terrain data. So this just outlines what the lab contents are for your students. In terms of what you actually receive from off screen, I'm just going to grab in here and pull in a Windows Explorer window. Hopefully, you're seeing this in the middle of my slide. This is what you'll receive if you request the labs. You'll see it's nicely organized by folder. Um, under the lab instructions, there are PDFs. I'm actually going to show you one of these in just a second, but each of these provide all of the instructions that your students will need to follow this lab content. Um, this may be something that you deploy to the students directly. You may give them a copy of this and have them go through these workflows themselves, or you may use this as the basis for what you do in the classroom. You provide you, again, a, a means to perform the instruction um, for each, uh, each lab uh, content. So this is, again, uh, for each of the individual labs. We have a PDF. We also have the data. Um, as you can see, now again, divided up by the individual labs. I'm going to be beginning in a second with lab one, and you've got all of the files that you need. Those will be referenced in the, in the uh, PDF. So very easy to follow, very easy to introduce these, uh, uh, these principles of GIS. So if, if you request the labs, this will be sent to you. You may also have noticed here, by the way, we also include finished exercise for teachers. I wouldn't give these to the students, but this, the teachers have access to all of the completed workflows so they can, again, assess the students as to how, uh, how they've performed in, in those exercises. So quick overview of what the lab contents contain. Uh, the PDFs I mentioned, I have a couple of examples open here. Let me grab one and bring it into view. So if you do download the labs and you're interested in using these, this is what you'll receive. Um, these can be printed, by the way. They are obviously in PDF format, much simpler to send them in a digital form. But if you do need to print them for whatever reason, you absolutely can. A little bit of an introduction to that particular lab content. This is the one, uh, the lab one, which is the introduction to the principles of GIS. And you get an overview. Then we get into some very basic workflows. You'll see section one covers importing and viewing data. Um, again, step-by-step -step instructions, screenshots where necessary and all of the necessary instructions that you'll need to follow to perform this operation. This, you can see a little bit of work with the digitizer here. Um, I do encourage instructors to be uh, creative and flexible in terms of how they deploy these. You may have some alternative data that you want to work with. By all means, you can, but obviously these are packaged uh, to um, simplify uh, the, the workflows. They're all uh, structured with specific instructions. Now, by way of illustrating how you can use these for teaching. I'm going to take out one section of this introductory lab. Now, this is where we kind of maybe cross over a little, little bit and make this into a little bit of a workshop. We're going to give you some instruction, but we're going to do this under the auspices of, of allowing you to see how you can instruct uh, um, using these labs. I'm going to scroll down to section six here, which is the basics of spatial analysis. Now, this is, again, is a very, very simple exercise. I'm going to bring in a couple of layers. I'm going to follow the instructions as they're written here. I'm going to open up Google Mapper. I'm going to bring in a couple of layers. I'm going to introduce uh, a number of tools that will al allow me to conduct, again, a very, very simple spatial analysis process. We have some cell phone tower locations, and we want to see their distribution over a specified area. So that is the, the uh, premise here. Um, let me go ahead and fire up Global Mapper. 
and we'll go through that exercise. Now, those of you who have access to the lab materials have already downloaded them, you can follow along if you want. Um, the same instructions and the same data obviously are something you have access to, by all means you can do that. Those of you who answered that poll question that you have not used Global Mapper before, this maybe is gonna be of interest to you in a different context. We're gonna introduce some very basic tools in the software. To begin this exercise, I'm gonna bring in some data. Uh, let me, again, open up a file here. And I want to drag and drop the simplest way for me to import. I'm going to drag and drop a shape file to begin with. You should recognize this. Some of you may recognize this is my home state. Uh, Nate's home state as well. This is the state of Maine. Just gives us a geographic context for what we're hoping to do here. Another layer I'm going to bring in again from off screen with apologies. I'll just drag and drop once again. And this represents the location of cell phone towers. As you can see, little dots on the map. Now, if you're using this as an introduction to GIS for students who have never encountered this type of uh, technology or this type of application before, you can spend some time talking about the data and talking about a point, talking about polygons, looking at attributes, looking at metadata. We're not gonna do that right now, but as you go through these procedures, giving these very simple um, steps that we're going through, you can deviate, you can be creative, and obviously use these for a broader instruction. Um, our objective, as I mentioned, in this specific section is to conduct an analysis of the distribution of these points. And we're going to do this very, based on a very simple uh, illustration. What we're going to do is create a grid, an array of tiles, if you like, that are going to be superimposed on top of this map view or a small section of this map view. And we're going to analyze how many of these towers fall within the extent. Now, again, very specific operation, very uh, simple operation here. I'm going to use my grid tool. I'm creating a grid, it's a digitizer tool, those of you who are not familiar with it, it's right here on my digitizer toolbar. This allows me initially to establish an anchor point for my grid and determine how many grid tiles. And again, again, this can be used in many situations. For this example, I simply want to use this as an illustration of how many points are contained within each tile. I simply click on the map to initiate this process and you can see it, I've get, I'm prompted with a number of options to determine the structure of this grid. Your students obviously will be following along. You can provide them the necessary parameters, but again, be creative. Allow them to be flexible in terms of how this is applied. Um, the instructions as they're written um, ask me to create a grid that's 10 rows by 10 columns. You'll see those values already populated here. And because of the scale of my data, I'm going to make these grid cells pretty large, 10 kilometers uh, um, wide, 10 kilometers tall, as you can see. So I should end up with 100 tiles, 10 kilometers uh, by 10 kilometers, 100 kilometers square. Um, in terms of where I anchor that, now where I clicked on the map would by default be the anchor point. I'm actually going to specify this. I'm going to establish uh, a defined anchor point. And you can see this is just based on manually entering some coordinates. And I am cheating here a little bit from off screen. I'm going to copy and paste a specific set of coordinate values. These are X and Y values, but by the way, these are projected coordinates. I believe they're UTM coordinates. And I'll just copy and paste. And hopefully we will see this when I click OK. And again, I'm not worried about any other settings here. We'll click OK. We'll see our grid superimposed on a small section of my map. Now I have the framework that will allow me now to conduct the analysis, this spatial analysis of the point data. The, the outline, by the way, and the polygons are just there for visual reference. What I'm really concerned with are the points themselves. The next part of this exercise is to determine how many points are within each cell. And again, think of this in maybe in some other academic disciplines, if you're in um, wildlife monitoring, for instance, where you've seen a particular species, you can use this for that type of application as well. Um, it's a very simple process. It's a digitizer function that allows me to assign an attribute that counts the number of points. Now, this is obviously a very specific menu, a very specific submenu. I don't expect you to remember this, but the detailed instructions as to how I get, got here are in the instructions that you'll see in the lab material. So you can just follow those instructions, add an attribute with a count of points and lines in each selected area. My polygons are selected. Confirming that that has been done, we'll click OK. And I'm just gonna deselect my polygons. To simplify things here a little bit here, I'm gonna close off a couple of layers and you'll see my tiles. My tiles are named based on a generic naming sequence that was part of that initial setup. But the important information that's now available to me, inevitably from off screen, I'll drag it into view, is the point count. As you can see, for each of these tiles, I have a number. This represents a number of cell phone towers in this case, but again, it could be any point uh, feature that's within the bounds of each tile. 
So I have the basis for a very simple analysis procedure, and I can illustrate this in a couple of different ways. Um, I can illustrate this based on simply replacing the label with the number, and I can, I can visualize it based on a very, very simple thematic map. For the students who have never done this type of work before, I'm sure they know what a thematic map is. They probably see them on a daily basis. But in terms of how these are created, this is a great illustration of this process. I'm going to go through the first uh, example first. I'm just simply going to replace the label. My label is based on that value that was applied during the grid setup. I'm going to replace it. I'm going to use the point count as my label. I just want to make sure I'm replacing the label that's there. This should work automatically. And there we go. So now we're starting to see a distribution model here. Now it's just numbers. You can kind of look at the numbers and see where there's a higher concentration. We put on a visual reference here, our main towns again, and we can see where those concentrations are located. So we're starting to see spatial patterns and obviously geo in a geographic context. To make this more meaningful, I'm going to change the color of these. And this again introduces the idea of thematic mapping. Double clicking once again to open up the um, uh, settings for that grid layer that was created. I can go to the area style section and I can choose to apply styling based on an attribute or name value. Um, there's a number of different ways that you can do this depending on the type of data. If it's numeric data, you can uh, employ a classification process to, to divide your data up into sections. To simplify this, I've done this already, and I'm gonna load a file that has these already in place. If I can find where they're located, give me a second here, because I believe they are in a particular folder here. and. Let me see where they are under data. I'm almost there. Let's see, towers, there we go. So this is just a file that contains this style already there. And you can see the colors that are assigned and the values that are assigned. I just saved that rather than doing it manually. And again, that's part of the instructions in this lab. And you can see if there's a cell with no tower, it's gonna have a white color and you can see the increasing values. Interpolating these colors, by the way, is important so that the colors actually will reflect the, the value within each tower. We'll click OK, and we get, again, a visual representation of that data. Very simplistic example of using simple point data and deriving a meaningful geographic distribution model here. Now, obviously, if I were to take this further, I'm not going to take the time right now because we want to cover some other workflows, but if I was to do this in a more uh, appropriate context, I would put a legend on my screen or even print the map. Maybe this is something that's going to be printed or exported, and again, a legend's going to be important. Yes, I see colors. What do those colors mean? With the colors present, I may not even need the labels because the, the colors are displaying the same information, so I can opt not to show my labels in this case. And again, it's a cleaner visual representation. So a quick example of a workflow that took me, what, uh, 10 minutes to go through. Granted, I went through it quite quickly, but if you're t dealing with this type of idea with your students, welcome to the world of GIS. From a very simple starting point, maybe you could have talked a little bit about where the data came from, but from a very simple starting point, you've given them the means to derive a visual representation of data distribution. And again, that is in essence what GIS gives us. So. Illustration number one. Um, any questions come in there, Nate? Any questions from? Yeah, I think um, some folks are wondering if uh, you know you've got your uh, main towns vector layer there. Could you have mm -hmm. done the same process uh, without creating the grid and just do it based on the count of? Absolutely, that would have been a great idea. Towns? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the, the grid layer, absolutely. Thanks for that one. Could have asked that question. Yeah, the, the, the reference layer, I brought it in for visual reference only so we can see where we are geographically. But yes, obviously every town has its own you know, number of points and the same procedure would have worked exactly the same way. I think in this example, I just wanted to keep the, the tiles consistent for this kind of maybe crude illustration of distribution. So yeah, that definitely would have been an option. Another way I could have done this, by the way, um, there is a tool for generating a density map. In fact, that's probably a preferred method to show this type of distribution of points. Um, that is also part of that lab, by the way. We actually introduced this tool. I'm not going to do it right now. But yeah, so yes, there are multiple ways of, of achieving the same end result. Keep those questions coming in, folks. We will, again, answer them uh, verbally or we can answer them uh, in writing. Uh, somebody did ask specific, specifically about the heat map. Uh, is it possible to add the heat map bar to the left with respect to the results? The interesting heat map, somebody used the term heat map. Um, heat map bar would be the legend. I would 
for this, I would put a legend on here because this is derived from vector data. If I actually did go through the process of deriving a heat map, it actually generates a raster layer where the pixels reflect these values in an interpolated way. Um, again, I encourage you if you have the labs to go through that process, but yes, that would automatically trigger the display of the corresponding legend to illustrate the um, distribution, the colors and reflect the uh, relevant distribution per pixel. So yes, answer to that question is yes. So this is one example of a workflow where we're using vector data and it gets part of our introductory lab. We do all the exercises in there on things like digitizing and drawing and et cetera, et cetera. Moving a little further down that list that I showed you, one of the other labs is working with, I'm actually gonna bring up my PowerPoint here, is working with raster data. And uh, lab four, if you do have access to the labs, we're gonna be delving into lab four. Now this one specifically is on rectifying an image. I don't think we're gonna have the time to go through the entire process, but Nate, um, why don't you give us an overview of how you can uh, use this lab to work with raster data? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as David mentioned, uh, this is coming from lab four. So now we're kind of moving into the world of uh, raster processing. Uh, there is a whole suite of tools available in Global Mapper to do a whole bunch of different types of raster analysis. Uh, but of course, before you can start with any raster analysis, you want to make sure that uh, whatever raster data, raster imagery you have, has spatial reference. Um, depending on where you got that data from, maybe you got it from online, uh, satellite imagery, you may have not have to go through this process. It may already have spatial reference information associated with it. Um, but you know, in an academic context, for example, uh, if you're like me, maybe you took uh, quite a few history courses when you were in school, um, and maybe you really <laughs> leaned into it and spent a couple of hours in the archives uh, looking at, at paper maps. So you know, these historic paper maps are a really great. Uh, great resource with really interesting data associated with them. It's just if you want to look at, you know, how geographic space was represented over time, for example. Um, but unfortunately, of course, since they're on paper, uh, they don't have any spatial reference information associated with them. So we're going to have to give it to them. Uh, but luckily, Global Mapper makes that very easy. So right here, um, if you couldn't tell from how it looks or from the name of it, this is a historic map of Central Park. This is uh, a paper map that was scanned and then uh, created as a, a JPEG file. So it doesn't have any spatial or geographic or coordinate reference information associated with it. You can see we've got, uh, well, let me zoom in a bit. We've got a little bit of, oh, hang on. There we go, a little easier to see. A little bit of uh, handwritten metadata associated with it. So again, this is Central Park in uh, Manhattan in New York City. And looks like this map is dated from the year 1875. So right now I've just got this open uh, in an image editor, image viewer, I should say. Um, but now we want to go ahead and take a look at that in Global Mapper. So first thing I'm going to do is open this other uh, imagery raster file here that does have uh, spatial reference information associated with it. Um, if you couldn't see from the uh, layer uh, name, layer description, or the, the, the name of the file, uh, this comes from OSM, which is OpenStreetMap. Um, if you're not familiar with it, OSM really is, a, a, I think, an indispensable resource for anyone who's involved in, in, in GIS work of any sort, really. Uh, what it is essentially is just a, a massive uh, collaborative open source project to essentially create a, a free and editable geographic database of, you know, the entire world, essentially. Um, so it's edited and quality controlled every day by, by users all around the world uh, to make sure that that spatial data is, is kept up to date and, and current. So here we are uh, in Manhattan uh, looking at Central Park. Uh, this is, of course, raster imagery. This is a TIFF file. Um, and this is uh, automatically, when I opened it in Global Mapper, going to be placed in the correct uh, spatial extent, geographic location. Uh, we can also pull in similar data from our Connect to Online Data tool right up here. Uh, as you can see, uh, built in, Global Mapper's got a whole bunch of open street map data, um, streets, topographic imagery, you know, you name it, uh, in addition to a whole bunch of uh, data sources that don't come from OSM. Some of these are built into the application itself to make it very easy. Um, but we've got this one saved locally, so we're, we're going to go ahead and use that. And so now what we want to do is compare that to our scanned paper map of Central Park, this JPEG file we have. So I'm going to click open 
And right away, Global Mapper is going to say, hey, you know, uh, we were unable to determine any spatial reference, any geographic uh, or locational extent for this image. So uh, how about we go, go ahead and add some? So I'm going to click OK, and right away, that's going to pull up the image rectifier. And this is really, I think, just a super intuitive way to go about and explain uh, this process to a new user. Um, essentially, what we're going to do is look for corresponding locations in this middle pane here, which represents the file that we're trying to rectify, um, that correspond to locations here on the right side pane, uh, which is, uh, you know, a view of our global map of workspace. Um, Central Park is a, basically a perfect rectangle, so it's a good uh, use case to practice this out on. And basically what we're going to do is, you know, zoom in as much as we can to make sure that we've got really precise uh, coordinates. I'm going to click on that first one, the image that we're going to try to rectify, find the corresponding location. So in this case, that looks like it says it's the 59th Street Columbus Circle. Um, and so these two points correspond with one another. So now that we've got them in both uh, files, we're just going to go ahead and click Add Point to List. And that's going to create uh, what's known as a ground control point, and it's going to basically tie this unreferenced map uh, to the one that is referenced here on the right. And we're just going to go ahead and do this for all four corners of the park. Um, you know, ordinarily, maybe if you wanted to have a little bit more uh, geographically precise or, or, or accurate information, you might have externally surveyed uh, survey points with known coordinate information, or maybe actual, if you had imagery with survey stakes, for example, that you could, uh, you know, click on that you have a little bit more confidence in their location. Um, that might be an approach as well, but uh, in our case, we just want to get a, a nice, quick and easy georeferencing or rectification uh, of our paper map onto our digital OSM map. So we've got four control points here. Um, we've got a couple of different options uh, to determine what the best rectification method is, and, and basically these just increase in terms of the, the sort of mathematical complexity uh, of what's going on kind of under the hood that Global Mapper is doing to apply uh, the rectification to this uh, scanned map. Um, it basically just depends on the number of ground control points you've got. Uh, we've got four, so you know we could do anything from a polynomial all the way down to uh, a linear. Um, but I'm just going to leave it in automatic and let Global Mapper determine based on, you know, the number of ground control points, the location, uh, projection information, things like that, to minimize the amount of distortion, let it choose how it wants to go about rectifying our imagery. So everything looks to be set up just right here, so I'm going to head, go ahead and click OK. Um, and it's going to let me know that, of course, if I'm not very satisfied with the output, uh, I can come back into reopen this this very same window from the image and change my ground control points if I need to. Click OK, and then right away now you can see we can see our scanned paper map and it's overlaying onto that uh, OSM digital map. Um, we can do some quick kind of comparison. We can of course adjust the uh, transparency uh, of that paper map to kind of see how does it look compared to the one underneath it. So if we look at maybe 50% transparency. Now we can see, okay, kind of looks like they, they line up pretty well. Um, we can also use the image swipe tool right here, and that's going to give us another really quick kind of visual comparison of these two layers. It's just going to let me kind of uh, mess with the, the, the visual display of that top layer so we can compare it to the layers that are underneath. Um, so now we can see still looks to be, uh, you know, looks to be pretty good. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe you want to actually be able to visualize both of them at the same time in a way that kind of minimizes the, the kind of discrepancy between the two layers. Um, so that uh, for that, we can make use of a tool called the uh, feathering, feathering tool. Um, so we're going to pull up our digitizer here, and we want to use a tool called uh, three-point draw. This is really handy for digitizing features that have nice uh, right angles, like uh, Central Park does, which is a, you know, a pretty friendly rectangular shape. So we're going to start on one corner here. Uh, whoops, zoomed out a little too far. Find this other corner here. So that's where we're going to anchor uh, this polygon. And then right away, Global Mapper is just going to give us a nice uh, rectangular shape. I'm going to drop that there. We'll call this, you know, Central Park, something like that. Click OK. So we've got a little uh, vector polygon feature overlaying that map now. I'm going to go ahead and select it. 
with the digitizer and then come into our layer options for Central Park here. And up here in the feathering tab, uh, we can decide how much we want to feather. So basically what that means is uh, if I select this option, feather within the currently selected polygon, it's going to crop out everything outside of the polygon, but it's going to make a, a, you know, a little bit of a smoother gradient between the parts that have been cropped and the parts that have been kept so that it, you know, the transition between it and the underlying layer uh, is a little bit more, you know, visually appealing, not so jarring. I'm going to set a border range of uh, 200 pixels and click OK, and it's going to crop that. Um, but if we zoom in here, we can see it looks like, you know, you can sort of see the sort of gradual transparency at the edge of the layer there. And if we, again, you can use the swipe tool to kind of see just how that uh, effect has sort of been applied there. Um, so just, uh, you know, a couple of really quick, uh, easy uh, tools that you can use to, to visualize raster imagery, um, you know, in different raster layers on top of each other, for example. Yeah, quick question came in Nate about exporting. Obviously this, the mm -hmm. image that you started with was just a picture, I believe it was a JPEG. Um, somebody somewhere scanned the historic map. I think the Library of Congress has done a lot of that work in the US and those scanned maps are readily available. Uh, but someone uh, asked a question about exporting, being able to export the output of what you just did into a geospatial format. Yep, absolutely. So anything that basically lives here in your uh, overlay control center can be exported uh, as an individual file or, you know, you can uh, tile it, change the resolution, what have you. But uh, essentially just right here is the, the export command and, you know, Global Mapper is going to recognize what type of image or what type of data it is. If it's a raster, then it's going to give you uh, basically a list of all the supported raster formats that you can export it as. So export it as a TIFF. That's handy because it's going to keep that same spatial reference information that we gave it in the rectification workflow and save it so that you don't have to go through the process again when you open it in, in Global Mapper again. Yeah, and it's it's hard for us doing what we're doing today, Nate, to not to take the kind of put on the hat of the instructor. Yeah, yes, we <laughs> right. want we want to give you an idea as to how Global Mapper works, and we are getting some questions specifically about these workflows. That's not our intent today. Our intent is to <laughs> illustrate how some of these tools can be used by you in an, an instructional context. But yeah, someone had mentioned uh, some questions came about OpenStreetMap specifically about the styling of OpenStreetMap. Um, what what Nate showed as a backdrop for this exercise is a raster version of the OpenStreetMap data that's readily available as a streamed data set. Nate, with apologies for giving you a barking in order here, but if you wouldn't mind opening up the online <laughs> data. Uh, no, no. And this is again useful for students providing access to readily available data set and you can stream uh, a number of data sets. Imagery might be a good option for a base map for this process. In fact, you may have may prefer imagery because it gives you a better ge geographic context for what you're trying to anchor. I like to use OpenStreetMap for this exercise because it shows me the street names. But OpenStreetMap that we streamed is, is raster. There is also an option here, and we're not going to go any further with this, as again, we're not teaching. If you want more detail on these types of workflows, sign up for training. We go into these in a lot more <laughs> detail in our public training classes. But you have an option to access the, the uh, vector version of OpenStreetMap as well. They can be stylized. They're pre-stylized based on on the common style, like roads and points of interest are styled appropriately, but that can be customized based on what you need. So someone asked that question specifically. Another question is why is metric being shown? Um, we tend to use metric by default in, in our classes. Folks attend these sessions from all over the world. And that's not to say you can't change your own settings, obviously. Um, you can use whatever uh, units of measure you want. We, we just tend to use metric for, for these illustrations, but that is certainly not uh, required. So um, someone also mentioned where to get this data. Where can you find this data? I'll hold off on that for a second. While I grab the screen back again, I'm going to show you um, the website that we'll be referring to where you can request these uh, materials. Nate, um, why don't you do this? Why don't you hold on to that workspace for the time being? Don't close yeah, it because we may have a little bit of time. Uh, we'll see how quickly we can get through our last little exercise to come back and visit this again, maybe to talk a little bit about vectorization. So hold tight. I'm going to grab the screen back again and just make sure I'm grabbing the right one. Um, confirming my screen is being shared. There we go. So we're back on our PowerPoint again. So again, to address the question that several of you asked, how do you get these materials? Someone asked as a student, can I request these materials? I would work through your teacher. It, it is just a formality, but we don't typically um, um, provide these directly to students. Just ask your teacher to put in the request. It's very simple, very uh, just a formality, and they will provide 
uh, we will be able to provide these materials to the academic institution rather than to individuals. Um, that said, let me show you very quickly our website. Those of you who have never been here, this is just bluemarblegeo.com. Where you will want to go specifically is under education and academic programs. And I'll just visit here very quickly so we can see what's involved. It is again in a more coherent way, uh, illustrates some of the points I was making earlier about the various programs we have available, including our academic curriculum. And within this, you can uh, request the materials. We, again, have an outline of what's available. Um, these are being updated and will be updated to reflect the new versions. It will be 2022 versions, hopefully within the next few weeks. Um, but if I click on that link, it's just a little form. Who are you? Where is what academic institution? What's your uh, position, etc. Very simple. You can throw in some comments in there as well. Um, we will address those when we find them and all we do is send you a link to download that data. So answering the question as to where I get that material, hopefully that provided that answer. Great questions, folks, by the way. Keep them coming in. It looks like you are a lot of you are interested in pursuing this uh, these materials are using these materials in your situation. We've got about 15 minutes left. I've got one more workflow that I want to illustrate. Um, we give you an example of a workflow using very simple vector data, some polygons and some points, and did a little bit of analysis. Nate showed us an example of working with raster data, and specifically working with a very basic type of raster file, an image file that didn't have any geographic intelligence. We were able to address that, and we could have taken that exercise even further by talking about things like extraction, which we may still have a chance to do a little bit later. So again, this is just a part of that workflow. For the final exercise, I'm going to jump to uh, lab 12 here on my list, and specifically we want to talk about terrain painting. This is a very interesting um, multi-step procedure where we first of all introduce the idea of working with uh, 3D data, working with terrain data or elevation data. We're actually going to derive a surface from some LIDAR. Again, this is just a very small section of what's a broader component of these labs. We'll just do it very quickly. But we want to use this to introduce the idea of painting terrain and to make this a little more meaningful, we have a specific scenario that we're going to follow. So um, again, to illustrate this, and those of you who have been through our training class will probably be familiar with this workflow because it's something we, we go through with our, our, our own students in our public training classes. This is LiDAR data. Those of you who are not, not familiar with LiDAR, it is a vector format. It is a point format. Every one of the points you see on my screen, of which there are 18.6 million, have an elevation. They've got a lot of other information as well, but the important thing for me is they have an elevation. Because what I want to do with this data is I want to create 3D uh, raster data, an elevation layer, terrain layer. You may have used other terms to describe that. A DEM is another example. Um, again, without dwelling on the specifics, I'm just simply going to transform, transform that LiDAR data into a surface. Um, I'm going to define the resolution of my output at one meter. Again, with, for the person who requested or mentioned we're using metric, your units of measure could be whatever you want. I'm using metric. I do want to make sure I'm only using points representing ground. I'm going to provide a little bit of a filter here. Uh, so it's just my ground points. And I'm specifically going to create what's called a DTM, and that's going to address the lowest point within my defined uh, linear area, my linear unit defining a box. Whatever value is within that extent, that's the lowest point, that's the one I want to use for the corresponding pixel in my terrain there. That creates, again, what you may have heard of, a DTM digital terrain, um, um, a, a binning a digital terrain model, a DTM. Um, that's all I need to do for now. I'm going to click OK. That shouldn't take too long. It's going to generate my raster layers, doing a little bit of gap filling here. The other things are happening behind the scenes. I still have my points. So I'm going to turn those off. They've served their function, and I have a raster layer. I'm just going to change one of the settings here. My vertical exaggeration set a little bit high. I'll bring it down so it's not quite as dark. There we go. And as you can see, we have a raster surface. I'm not going to take the time to explore this. We could spend the rest of our, what, just over 10 minutes going through this. I'm not going to, again, if you want more information uh, on how this works, sign up for our training class, but we have a 3D layer. Um, what I want to do is sculpt the terrain. I want to modify the terrain. And to do that, I can use a fairly new tool in Global Marvel, which is called Terrain Painting. And this is something your students can work with if they're working maybe in an engineering course, if they want to simulate this, the flattening of an area for perhaps site preparation. Or in this example, we're going to simulate the creation of a dam. We're going to create a containment area. And ultimately, with 10 minutes left, my objective in this exercise is to determine how much water would be contained within a dam that I'm simulating in my surface here, my terrain data. 
Um, to help me with this, I've got a couple of little point features. They don't really serve any function other than to give me a visual reference, but my DAM is going to be created across this extent. Now, terrain painting, as its name implies, allows you to literally draw terrain. It's a button here in my um, analysis toolbar. I'll pop up the dialog box. And again, I could spend a long time going through the options. I won't. Specifically, what I want to do in this example is to set the terrain height based on a line that I'm going to draw. And I can define what those parameters are. First of all, I can define the brush size. Think of this as a kind of drawing the terrain. How wide is your brush? This can be either based on the grid cells, which is the based on the resolution of my data, or it can be based on a linear unit in meters or feet. I want my dam to be, let's say, five meters wide. That's linear unit, the width of my dam. Um, the height is important. In this case, I want my dam to be 16 meters tall. Now, in this case, it's going to be 16 meters absolute above sea level. This happens to be fairly close to sea level here, so this is going to create a flat surface 16 meters above um, the, um, the sea level. You can also define the height based on a value relative to the local ground. That's lower or raised, depending on what's appropriate. That's not relevant for our workflow. I'm specifying a height. Feathering allows me to integrate the raised terrain into the surrounding area. So with these settings applied, all I do is Wait, my uh, cursor. David, looks like you've got a 50 meter. Thank you. I just noticed that I was just about to say because the cursor will reflect the brush size. I must have had accidentally hit a zero on the end there. Thank you for that, Nate. But yeah, the blue circle indicates the feathered extent. The red circle, difficult to see, but is the five meter width. And all I'm going to do is simply connect these dots. It will enable snapping. It actually snaps to a vector feature, which is very useful. Left click, right click, just like I would with the digitizer. Those of you familiar with Global Mapper. And if you see on my terrain, I've actually drawn on some terrain. Um, I'm going to close the dialog box. I'm going to turn off the two points I use for my reference. I'm going to zoom a little closer and pop up my 3D view. And you'll hopefully see the result of my engineering project, maybe bumping up the exaggeration just a little bit for effect here. And we can see the dam that I created here. This is what I was able to use. Now, this uh, using this with your students, especially again, those in an engineering field, being able to simulate uh, as part of the planning process for an engineering project before you set foot on the ground, you can do a lot of this work within Global Mapper to create these visualizations. Maybe you need to engage with the local community if that's kind of a, a, an engineering project that's going to be initiated. I'm not quite done with this workflow because yes, you know, illustrating this process, just you know, creating a dam, very useful. But what I want to do next is to uh, determine the amount of water that will be contained in my reservoir if I actually went through this construction process. And I can do that using a number of tools in a very creative way. First of all, I'm going to use my contouring tool. Contouring is a very important component of Global Mapper's terrain analysis suite. Um, allows you to define um, the linear connection between pixels of equal elevation and to typically used as many of you most of you i'm sure are familiar with creating these um, concentric lines those vector lines representing your terrain in this example i'm going to use a much more creative use because i want to specify not a contour interval or range but rather a specific contour that being 15 meters now if you are following along in my exercise my dam is 16 meters tall it's 60 meters absolute above sea level i want my water level to be a meter below the top of the dam that being oops got that one more time that being 15 meters and i only want to generate a contour at that height so there are a number of other settings as you can see pertaining to generation of contours i'm not going to worry about those now i'm simply going going to click okay and if everything goes according to plan it should create a contour layer for me. The most important of uh, contour of which is this one that you're seeing. Hopefully you're seeing this on my screen because this is now going to be the basis for my reservoir. This represents the uh, lateral extent of the body of water that will be formed. In order for me to calculate volume, I need to compare that to the terrain. I need to literally count the number of pixels multiplied by their height to determine how much water would be contained within this dam. In order to do that, I'm going to convert this contour to a polygon. And again, as we go through these individual steps with your students, you can address the idea of points and lines and polygons and how each applies in certain situations. Lines work great for contours, but they don't work best when I'm doing this kind of broad uh, geographic analysis. I need a polygon for that. I need to determine the area. So I've got a very simple tool that converts lines to polygons. A few settings in here. I'm just going to leave the defaults. 
or click OK, and I can call my new layer reservoir. And you'll notice as we're going through these workflows, we're introduced to various elements of Global Mapper. We're back in the, the vector world again. Um, we're generating vector features, polygons in this case. We can define a feature style. I'm going to make the uh, lake look like a lake. It'll be a blue polygon as opposed to a generic on-fill polygon. I don't really need the label for this. I don't want that to appear on my map, so I'll remove that from the layer and we'll click OK. Now, if everything, again, goes according to plan, I now have a body of water. Five minutes to go. I think I'm going to I'm going to finish this on time. Let me turn off the contours. They have served their function. I'm left with my terrain, my modified terrain, including my dam, and the extent of my body of water. And if you remember back in the start, we uh, the challenge we were going to to uh, address, or the question we're going to address, is how much water would be in this. Again, your students will be introduced to this idea of volume calculation based on the extent of the polygon. It's a simple procedure. Um, uh, right click analysis measurement and pile volume. There are other ways to get to this tool, but this is the simplest. Pile volume implies it's something sitting above the ground, but it will work equally well in reverse, where we're looking at what's underneath the extent of this surface. Very simple, and we get a report. Now, don't worry about all the numbers here. The important one here is this fill volume. So based on what, less than 10 minutes work, using some LiDAR data and using a simulated dam, I was able to determine, and again, with apologies to the folks who are asking about non-metric, this is metric, cubic meters, but I can see that I'm going to be able to retain, what, 83,000 cubic meters of water in my containment palm, pond if I built a dam 16 meters above sea level in that area. So that is a, a very specific little workflow that's part of that final lab. Uh, your students will be introduced to these uh, workflows. And again, we, we typically recommend that you be creative in how these are introduced. Any questions come in, Nate, while I'm on my spiel? Um, terrain painting function. Sounds like folks are excited about that. Uh, is this available in Global Mapper base version or does this require a pro module? It is a pro-specific tool. It's a great, great question. So terrain painting is one of the more advanced tools that those of you who have been using Global Mapper for a while will recall that we had the LiDAR module. The LiDAR module kind of fulfilled its use uh, because we, we realized there were more advanced tools that were not LiDAR specific. This is one of those. Um, so we, we quietly retired the LiDAR module, we replaced it with Global Mapper Pro, and this, along with a number of other tools, are part of that pro module. So yeah, it is part of Global Mapper Pro. Is there, someone asked, is there a reason uh, for dividing the 12 labs with each corresponding topic? Just just for simplicity of consumption. They, they are a single standalone entity, so I know in certain situations uh, there may be a particular type of content that's relevant. Like For instance, the example that Nate showed us is very specific. Um, maybe the his, history class is using some historic maps. They don't really need what we've done here. They don't need to be uh, concerned about terrain analysis. They just need to be able to work with the historic maps, maybe as a time series. Um, Nate showed us that image swipe. You could have an image swipe that shows the comparison of, of uh, Central Park, 1875, 1930, 1950, and that image swipe tool is, is great for that type of use case. So the reason we divided them up into those individual topics is because the, the teachers can pick and choose uh, what is most relevant. So yeah. Nate, with apologies, I don't believe we have uh, time. <laughs> Quite all right. <laughs> To have to have you finish. If we had had, we kind of kept that in our back pocket a little bit. We weren't sure how much time these exercises would take, but one of the things that Nate was going to show us is the idea of extracting vector features from raster, uh, those bodies of water in Central Park, the pond, I don't know what it's called. Is it called the pond? In Central Park, we uh, could have vectorized those. called the Croton Reservoirs. There we go. So Nate could have created those as vector features. If you want to see that uh, at work, then you're going to have to either go to the, grab the labs and use them in your classroom, <laughs> or if you're not a teacher, uh, come to our training class and we can show you that too as well. Um, thank you for your questions, folks. Um, again, our objective today, I'm going to try to bring up my PowerPoint here if I can find it. There we go. Uh, was to provide enough with an hour. We don't have a lot of time to spend, but it, maybe some of the highlights of these curriculum materials. Uh, those of you who are in academia right now, and a fairly large percentage of those I noticed in the registration that are .edu's or some variation thereof, by all means, grab these. They're yours. They're, they're available to you. Um, we will be 
um, sending those who participate in these labs a survey. I hope that's scheduled to come up in the next, uh, probably the next couple of weeks to get your feedback. So if you have been using lab materials, this is an opportunity for you to give us uh, your feedback and also to request maybe additional lab materials you might find useful in your context. So we want to make sure we're keeping these lines of communication open to make sure that what we're developing is uh, relevant. That's all I have. Uh, anything we missed, Nate? I know we crammed a lot into an hour. Anything that we missed? Well, I mean... <laughs> yeah, I know. We don't answer that question. There's a lot. A lot. Yeah. Um, folks, uh, if you have questions, and for those of you who are new to Global Mapper, thank you for attending, by the way. Really appreciate your interest in this application, even though you're not currently using it but if you are interested um, you can go to our website and download a trial version um, or if you're a teacher and you want to put it through its paces absolutely we'll send you up with a trial license uh, over and above the formal licensing that we'll provide um, if you have questions on licensing orders at bluemarblegeo.com is a good place to go if you've technical questions a lot of questions come in about these workflows uh, our tech support team is uh, at geohelp at bluemarblegeo.com it really strong possibility Nate may be one of the folks who helps you mm -hmm. with any questions that you ask if you have a question about what we've covered in this session if you're watching the recording perhaps please reference the fact that you you sat through this hour-long presentation it will help us to answer that question in the appropriate context so again if you're watching the recording just make sure you note that as well and as I've we've been noting throughout the course of the program if you want to see more information on our academic programs I quickly previewed the website a few minutes ago but you can go to bluemarblegeo.com slash academic programs. Folks, thank you for taking the time. Nate, thank you for lending your expertise. I think you've got an ongoing gig now, so we're going to have you <laughs> participate in these ongoing, lending your, your uh, expertise to these workflows. Thank you very much, Nate, for your help Absolutely. with this. And again, thank you folks for attending and put on your uh, sign up for the next one. I believe it was February 23rd. We're going to be introducing yeah. you to the new functionality in version 23.1. So um, registration is now open. Thank you, folks. Right. Thanks, everyone.